So today we're going to talk about locking amplifiers, what they are, and how they work. Locking amplifiers are incredibly powerful tools, and if you don't know about them, well, here's a chance to understand them. So what is a locking amplifier? Locking amplifiers, they're used to pull out very weak signals that are completely buried in noise. And the signal has to be a repetitive signal for this to work. It's usually a sine wave. And you need a couple of inputs on a locking amplifier. The first input is, of course, your noisy signal. But you need a second input, and that's a reference. A reference is just a sine wave that has the same frequency as the signal you're trying to pull out of the noise. And in some cases, you've got to worry about the phase relationship between your reference signal and the signal you're trying to pull out of the noise. Uh, depending on the model of the lock and amplifier, sometimes you have to adjust that. And you get a single output. And that single output is just one value, and that value tells you the amplitude of your signal that was buried in the noise, as well as the phase relationship between that signal and your reference. And in fact, lock and amplifiers are also used for phase detection. So here's some examples of lock and amplifiers. I've used all three of these. They all have their values. Uh, Stanford Research Systems have been the kind of um, standard lock and amplifier that's been used for a lot of years. They are fantastic tools. You have the older ones like the SR530 that are analog. And in fact, this presentation more describes how an analog unit works. Then you have the newer ones, which are digital, and that means they actually do digital processing to do these analog concepts. And now you can even get these simple AD630s. They're a whole analog, well, analog lock and amplifier on a chip, and, and they're really inexpensive. Not as nice or, or as uh, sensitive as these nice benchtop Stanford tools, but very functional as well. So what's, what are the steps that a lock and amplifier does? The first step is you got to pull away the DC offset. And I should start by saying that because any signal can be described as a series of different sine waves with different amplitudes and phases, if we want to study the concept of how a lock and amplifier works, we can start by studying a single sine wave, which will represent all the other sine waves used to make your noisy signal. So first we, we, we subtract off the DC offset, like that. So now once that's done, you'll notice that after the DC component is removed, that you're left with a sine wave, which has positive and negative values. It's, it's positive half the time and negative the other half the time. So if we time average that sine wave or any sine wave, you get an average value of zero. If you just time, if you just add up all the high levels and all the low levels, you get an average value of zero. What that also means by extension is the average of any combination of sine waves is also zero. So think about that. Any signal, if you do a DC offset and time average it, you get an average value of zero because it's negative just as often as it is positive. So step two that a lock and amplifier does is to mix the signal with the reference. And the word mix in this case really means multiply. So here we have our signal. Now that blue curve is the signal buried in the noise. So you can imagine a whole bunch of other noise, but those are all just sine waves of different frequencies. This is the signal that matches the reference. So the reference is green, the signal is blue. When you multiply the two, it's effectively squared. Now you have sine squared. This is called a homodyne. You, you've multiplied the frequency by itself. Sorry, I didn't draw the sine wave perfect, but that's just a drawing error. So imagine a sine wave. And now, now that you've made a sine squared value, notice all the values are no longer straddling zero. They're all above zero in this case. And so the time averaged value of a squared sine wave is going to, in this case, it's positive. It could also be negative or even zero, depending on the phase relationship. Now, I started with the phase relationship of the, the signal and the reference on top of each other, but we're gonna see some examples of that being different. So now this is interesting. If we take a signal frequency component, which in these cases is all basically noise, and you multiply it by a reference, 
the two frequencies are different, they make a new frequency in purple. That's your heterodyne, that's a beat frequency. And it could be any kind of crazy weird frequency, but you'll notice I've also, uh, on the bottom of each graph, gave the value, the time average value of each one, and they're all zero or close to zero because I didn't average for a long enough length of it. And so if you multiply two different frequencies, you get a new frequency, a beat frequency, heterodyne, but the average is still zero. It still straddles positive and negative. So this is the technique which is gonna get rid of all your noise. All your noise is gonna get multiplied, but it will always end up with some combination of frequencies which are above and below zero and have an average value of zero. But if your reference frequency matches your signal frequency, and remember your signal frequency is the one buried in your noise that you wanna to try to get out. Here we have the signal, which is blue. That's the signal you're trying to get out of the noise. Green, which is your reference, they're right on top of each other because they're the same frequency and the same phase. And the product is this purple curve. And notice it's all above zero. It's sine squared. Now, the amplitude of it is half. You've lost half your amplitude, but that's a price you pay for this noise re reduction technique. So the time average value of your signal in this case is 0.5. Why all the other components that we saw are zero and you're left only with your signal. In this case, the phases match. What about other phases? Here's one where the reference and the signal are 180 degrees out of phase. And you still end up with a non-zero average value, but your, your product sine wave is all negative, 100% negative. So minus one half for, for uh, 180 degrees out of phase. What about some other combination of phases where the frequency is right, but the phase is, is off? Here you can see just an assortment of some different uh, examples I did with different phases. Uh, each of the graphs has a title showing the phase offset in degrees between the reference and the signal. They're all the same frequency, just different phases. And you can see they, they make a sine wave, which in some cases can even straddle zero. And so it will also have a zero value. That's if it's a, a, an integer multiple of 90 degrees, so like 90 degrees or 270. And that's why knowing the phase relationship or adjusting the phase relationship between your signal and your reference can be important. And a lot of the newer lock-in amplifiers do that for you. They give you both the amplitude and the phase offset. So now that we've seen how each individual step works, we can put it all together. Uh, first, you strip away the DC components. Then you mix the reference with the noisy signal. This now makes your signal that's embedded in a noise have something different than all the rest of the noise. And the thing that's different is it's basically offset. It no longer straddles zero while all the other noise does. And third, you take the time average and that averages out all that noise. And the longer you average, the more noise suppression you have. It makes the time response slower. You have to wait longer to get your answer, but you cancel out more noise. And let's not forget the fourth step, which is amplification. The signal that's left over after all that noise is removed can be amplified a great amount. And that's thanks to the fact that we remove the DC components. Imagine if you had a one volt offset to begin with and you multiplied by a million, well, that would give an output of a million volts, which isn't gonna happen. But since all the, the noise is gone, all the DC offset is gone, all you have is your tiny, tiny signal left over, you can multiply that with a low noise amplifier by a much higher number. Instead of five or 10, it can be a thousand or a million. This is extremely effective. And for this reason, if you're trying to take, let's say you have a, a very low level signal that's DC, it's just a constant signal, it makes sense to use an optical chopper or some type of thing to modulate it, which throws away much of your signal. If you think about that, if you have a DC signal and you're going to AC, you're throwing away half of it at least. And then again, when you mix it with your reference, you throw away another half. So you're cutting your signal down at least by a factor of four. <laughs> but your noise is smashed down much, much lower than your signal. Thus your signal to noise ratio is greatly improved, making lock-in amplifiers fantastic tool and the technique of modulating with the reference signal, a fantastic method to see very low level signals. Thanks for watching.